Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. <laughs> good to be with you. Nice. Thank you for visiting Lithuania. Uh, you are here already almost a week. Yes. And you have visited basically the most important educational institution, institutions already. Basic Training Regiment, Lithuanian Armed Forces School, Combat Training Center in Nemenchina. The next video visit will be to the Military Academy and the main topic is Mission Command. Yes. The main topic is Mission Command and uh, we will talk about Mission Command and uh, what actually already happened before a little bit later. But yesterday you said that the Vilnius probably the nicest city in the world or at least in Europe and the only city which may compete is, is Prague. So it looks like you're kind of in love with Lithuania. Is that true? <laughs> Very much so. Uh, so. So why, sir? Well, because you know, task purpose. <laughs> what <right>. and why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, going back 23 years ago, in January 2000, I flew into Lithuania for the first time and I spent a year here. I was the military liaison team chief. Uh, brought in uh, small mobile training teams from the United States to provide information to the Lithuanian Armed Forces, sent small teams from the Lithuanian Armed Forces over to the United States. And I think uh, that effort did a lot to help Lithuania uh, join NATO. Uh, so I was very proud of uh, being over here for a year, made a lot of good friends during that period of time. and. Uh, then in 2016, I had the opportunity to become the Deputy Commanding General for National Guard for U.S. Army Europe. And during that period of time, I visited Lithuania uh, a lot. Uh, matter of fact, uh, three years in a row, I, I ran in the memorial run from the cemetery to the TV tower to recognize the atrocities that occurred on January 13th. Uh, of 1991, I believe. I very much respect the Lithuanian Armed Forces because they're very professional. Uh, they are always seeking to improve and uh, they, they believe in defending their nation. So I have a lot of respect for the Lithuanian Armed Forces. Thank you, sir. Mm. Oh, by the way, one more thing. Yes, please. The other reason I respect the Lithuanian Armed Forces so much is they've served along with uh, the United States and other NATO allies in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Uh, so they've done a lot to uh, go into combat and perform extremely well. Thank you, sir. I've been myself in Afghanistan and in Iraq later. And actually, we've been in Iraq approximately at the same period of time, right. to, to 2005. Uh -huh. And I say, no, it was not, not the safest place and not the safest period. C can you reflect a little bit on, on your experience in Iraq? Sure, yeah. I, I uh, commanded a brigade in Ramadi, Iraq in 2005 and 2006. I had 5,000 soldiers and United States Marines under my command. It was a very violent, chaotic time there. I believe uh, if you read any contemporary history, most historians will say that Ramadi, Iraq was the most dangerous place on the face of the earth at that time. Uh, we had many casualties uh, and our soldiers and Marines conducted their operations very bravely. And one of the things I'm most proud of is even though the uh, conditions were very violent, our soldiers and Marines adhered to their values and uh, they performed very professionally. I'm very proud of, of the service that they did. You mentioned the word values. Mm -hmm. Values actually belong to the teams and the leaders, actually the members of the teams. Mm -hmm. What you were doing to promote the values? Yeah, well, you know, uh, the Army values, uh, we have seven of them. Yes, sir. Yeah, loyalty, duty, uh, respect. respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And uh, we had conversations about the values. You know, when, when we would uh, be taking casualties, uh, you know, we had conversations that we still had to perform professionally. We still had to treat the Iraqi civilians with dignity and respect. 
Uh, and um, so uh, I, I think we, we just continue to reinforce the fact that we had to be professional, that, <clears throat> that um, the values of our Marines and, and soldiers set us apart from the insurgents there. You know, we valued life, we valued human dignity, and uh, I, th I think just continuing to reinforce that throughout the deployment uh, really, really helped. Great, great. Uh, you mentioned the professionalism, because uh, in the Ukrainian forces we just revised values, now we have four of them. Mm -hmm. And the professionalism is one of those, let's sure. say. Initiative is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, fighting spirit is, is the third one, you know. Uh, loyalty. Mm -hmm. Reliability is the fourth one, and when you're looking, you know, seven and four, it's actually more or less the same, but yes. by, 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 by the feeling, by, by the content. Mm -hmm. And because I already heard your presentations on mission command and basic training regiment and the um, uh, senior armed forces school and in a <clears throat> combat training center, I think the most important slide in your presentation. It's a slide with the seven principles of mission command. Because as I understood, by application of those principles, mm -hmm. you, you can implement it, you know. And it really helped for us to, 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 to explain, to interpret, to, to, to foresee the ways for the uh, implementation. I, I, I will read it loud, those seven principles. And I will ask you a question, which you think, mm -hmm. if you choose one, mm -hmm. which is the most important? So the seven principles are competence, mutual trust, mission orders, commander's intent, shared understanding, disciplined initiative, and risk acceptance. So which one is the most important? Yeah. That is a very hard question. Yes, you know, <laughs> that's why I asked it. <laughs> because those, those seven principles, I look at them as seven behaviors. Uh, and to implement mission command, I really think it all it starts with something we already talked about. It starts with your character as a person. It starts with the values of, of uh, your personal values and then your organizational values, whether it be Lithuanian Armed Forces or United States Army. Um, so mission command is all about leadership and, and, and good leadership. Um, if I had a pick, <laughs> one of those principles, I have a hard time deciding, to be honest with you, between mutual trust and commander's intent. Because I do think mutual trust is so important to an organization. An organization cannot function effectively unless the leaders trust the subordinates, the subordinates trust each other, the subordinates trust the leader. It's, it's like the oil in an engine. It makes the organization flow smoothly. But then commander's intent is also uh, important because the commander's intent has, has three elements, purpose, key tasks, and end state. And I really think purpose is, is so powerful uh, that if uh, the soldiers understand what the overarching purpose of the mission is uh, and, they, and, and they achieve that purpose, even if they don't uh, do what they had to do in terms of the mission, but they achieved the purpose, it's, it's successful. Uh, but I would say, uh, please give me a pass. Let me, let me select two of them. I would, say, I would say mutual trust and commander's intent are the two most important. Actually, if you would ask the same question to, to me, uh -huh. I, I would have probably even more hard time to, to choose. <laughs> then I would probably still to two as well. And the mutual trust would, would coincide. Yeah. But another one that they would choose, it would be a competence. Uh -huh. Because I cannot trust incompetent person. Sure, sure. So, and the competence, in my understanding, is a knowledge, it's a skill, and the values as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he may not be reliable because, because he, he's not honest. Yes. Because he is lacking, you know, selflessness. Exactly. And even though it is still kind of in the part of values, I, I would, can, I got a feeling it, it's part of the competence. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, you're exactly right on trust. And you know, I have a, a model that I show during the course of this mission command presentation, which shows that that trust really encompasses character, 
uh, which are the, uh, the values and also one's intent, which is their personal agenda. And then also, uh, as, as you mentioned, competence, you know, the, the training one has, but then also the results that one has, mm -hmm. has gotten. Uh, you know, so if, you're, if you've been putting a lead, in a leadership position and you have the appropriate training, but in terms of the results you get, you're always failing the mission, uh, that erodes trust. So competence and character are both so important in cultivating trust with, with the people that you lead. One of the things, one of the seven principles is a disciplined initiative. And uh, some people think initiative is initiative. And when you are putting those two words in a disciplined initiative, some, you know, free mind people would think it's oxymoron. It's how it's disciplined and initiative. Can you elaborate a little sure. bit on disciplined sure. initiative? See, it's all about um, subordinate units have to understand the commander's intent, not only one level up, but two levels up. So, for example, if you're a company commander, you have to understand the commander's intent of your battalion commander but also the commander's intent of your brigade commander. Two levels up, yes. Two sir. levels up. And uh, disciplined initiative means you could display initiative as long as you achieve the purpose in the, and hopefully the end state in the commander's intent. I would say even the key tasks in the commander's intent aren't so import, important, but disciplined initiative means displaying initiative, uh, figuring out how to achieve the objective as long as it meets that purpose. So that's where the disciplined initiative comes in. Uh, talking about types of the leadership, uh, sometimes we are talking about toxic leadership. Mm. So do you have toxic leaders in the United States? What, what is actually in yeah. your understanding toxic leadership and what you do to detoxicate if, if yeah. it's needed? No, that, that, that's a good point. Uh, of course, uh, Toxic leaders, unfortunately, exist everywhere, including in the United States. And uh, I've, I've worked for several toxic leaders in, in the 40 years that I've been in the, in the Army. Most of the leaders I have worked for have been very character-based servant leaders, just remarkable leaders uh, who were great coaches and, and mentors to me, but there's been a few. And I found the best way to deal with it. But let me, let me kind of define my own definition yes, of toxic yes, leadership first. I think a toxic leader is someone who does not treat their subordinates with dignity and respect. Uh, they're someone who places their own personal goals ahead of the goals of the organization. Uh, they look out for their own career. And they're just uh, generally not very nice people to be around. And perhaps they don't communicate very well, perhaps they don't explain the purpose, they don't provide their commander's intent very well. All of those things, I think, lead to be a, a, a toxic leader. But I think the, the, the primary thing is, is they treat people without dignity, without respect, uh, which, is, which is really a, not a good situation. Uh, the way I've dealt with toxic leaders is I've tried to maintain, well, not tried, but I have maintained my professionalism uh, I've tried to lead up. You know, we talk about leading by example a lot of times when we think about leading by example. We think of a leader leading by example in order to inspire uh, the troops or soldiers that they command or lead. But I think if you, you could lead by example, you could lead up. Uh, if, if you continue to perform professionally and demonstrate dignity and respect to that toxic leader and to the people who work for you, I think um, there is a possibility to change the attitude of that toxic leader. So I think that's the best way to detoxify a leader is just uh, by continuing to perform in a very professional way uh, and, uh, and, and leading up, leading by example up toward that toxic leader to try to show them the, the appropriate way to lead. Uh, thank you. You mentioned dignity and respect. In Lithuania, we possibly call it like a care, mm -hmm. because commanders cares about the subordinates first, and then the subordinates 
will will respect and care about the commander. Absolutely. Because it, it, it plays us as a mirror. And uh, this is kind of care element. Yeah, could, could I talk about care yes, for please. a moment? Yes, please. Uh, of course, care means putting the needs of the soldier before your own personal needs. That's why we say in the army, leaders eat last. It's yeah. kind of symbolic that if you're in the if you're in the chow line, you're going to let the soldiers eat first, and you're going to eat behind them. So, if in case you run out of food, you know at least your soldiers had the food before you had the opportunity. Uh, and I think care is really getting to know the soldier uh, because it's important for leaders to get to know their people so they could understand the competencies, uh, the, the confidence of the people they lead. The feelings. Yeah, the feelings, all of those things are important. It's also important to get to know the family, you know, understand what the family situation is. You know, do they have any children? Are they married? Uh, do they have older parents who might be suffering from uh, some of the uh, problems of, of older age, all of those things. And the, but I think one of the most important things is you show care to the soldiers by removing obstacles from their path so they could do their job better and also providing them the resources they need so they could carry out the mission. And, and a lot of times the, the, the subordinates might not be in a position to remove those obstacles or get those resources for themselves but you as the leader could possibly be in the position to do that, or you can ask your higher, higher level leader for those resources that, that your soldiers need. One more question, sir. In the mission command, one of the very important elements is a tolerance to the mistakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to tolerate mistakes, how to see, you know, fixable, unfixable, skill mistake, character mistake, honest mistake, dishonest mistake. Sure. C can you elaborate on yeah. this? Yeah, I think an honest mistake is someone who, a lot of times, if, if you demonstrate initiative, that might mean you're trying something new. And, and so you might make a mistake when you try something new because nobody ever tried it before. Uh, and and it, I think it's fantastic if, if someone does that during a training. Because the time to make mistakes is during training rather than in combat. Uh, and so I think it's imperative that you allow your subordinates the flexibility so they could try new things to see if they work in a, in a training situation. Uh, so that, that's one, one point there. But uh, th that's really what I think an honest mistake is, is trying your best, trying to do the right thing, but sometimes things just don't work out. And I think the best way a leader could handle that is to help that subordinate learn from those mistakes. So take them on the side and ask them, hey, what were you thinking? Why did you try it this way? <clears throat> what would you do differently next time? And help them to, to learn from those mistakes. Now, a character mistake is a completely different matter. Uh, and I think uh, if, you're, if, if you have someone who is very, very new to the military, maybe somebody who just got their commission as a second lieutenant, or maybe somebody who just decided to join the professional force as an enlisted person, or a very young NCO. If they make a mistake of character, you have to, they have to understand that that's a very, very serious violation. That may not necessarily end their career, though. And, uh, you know, uh, one of uh, our German friends who was presenting at the uh, uh, Nemanchina yesterday, mm -hmm. I think he said something very good. He said, if, if you make a mistake of ability, that takes retraining. If you make a mistake of character, that takes education. So I think you have to try to educate uh, a younger person if they make a mistake of character. However, uh, if you have somebody in the military who is a, a very high rank, and let me say lieutenant colonel and above, for example, uh, those character violations have to be treated a little bit differently because you would expect somebody who is a sergeant major, a lieutenant colonel, a colonel, a, God forbid, a general officer, if they make a mistake of character, that's a very ser serious violation. And depending on what that mistake of character was, that might very well end that particular leader's career. Hmm. Sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, care. I'll tell you why character is so important in, in the military and why values are so important in the military. 
<clears throat> because when you think of it, the, the military uh, is one of the only organizations that has the authority to legally take somebody else's life on the battlefield. And also a military commander could legally order a soldier to do something that may very well cause that soldier to risk their life. Uh, you know, it may be paid to ultimate price. And so when you have that awesome responsibility, character and values are extremely important when, when, when that responsibility is placed upon a leader. Yes, sir. You, you, you mentioned you, you lost in Ramadi 82 soldiers killed in action. You have got another 260 badly wounded. So I, I, I understand that you don't really only understand it, you feel it, yes. because this happened to you, the responsibility of the commanders and actually the, the sacrifices what soldiers did. Uh, completion of our interview, but we talked about principles. Mm -hmm. We talked about specific details like a toxic leadership, sure. mistakes, tolerance for mistakes, you know, initiative. And of course, people can, can, can read and uh, people can find you on the internet, it's, it's very easy. But uh, application of principles, what for? The purpose. Yeah. We, we haven't actually said what is Mission Command. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I, I think if you want to implement Mission Command, that's where those principles come in. Those, those principles are a guide on how to implement uh, the Mission Command. I, I like, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'll mention it again, I like to look at those principles as behaviors. Yes. They are a guide on how a commander should behave. Uh, and actually, not only a commander, but really everybody in the military organization, because I believe everybody is a leader. Or may become very soon. Yeah, exactly, and, or an aspiring leader. And, and uh, it's, it's a good guide on how to behave in order to implement mission command. And the mission command is? Well, the mission command is the United States Army's uh, approach to command and control. So command and control is still very important. You know, a commander still has legal responsibilities and the authority to order subordinate units to do certain, certain missions. Um, you know, control is the regulation of forces and what we call the war fighting functions. Uh, so, uh, you know, command and control is still very important. And, th and that's great. I'm glad you brought this up because mission command doesn't mean that you just let everybody run free and do whatever they want to do. Obviously, we talked about disciplined initiative. Mission command is about essentially telling subordinate units what to do and why they need to do it, and then allowing the subordinate units to be creative and demonstrate initiative by by figuring out how to accomplish a mission. Decentralized execution. Yep, yeah, yeah, centralized planning, decentralized execution. And uh, I would like to propose to you to use the opportunity to say something, whatever you want, to the Lithuanian soldiers, officers, yeah. generals, and to the general public. Yeah, well I think uh, the general public of, of Lithuania could be very proud of the Lithuanian Armed Forces. Uh, the Lithuanian Armed Forces have shown that they are uh, not only being supported by NATO, but they are a contributor to NATO. And I think that's extremely important. And we talked about, you know, you've been in Iraq, you've been in Afghanistan, many other Lithuanian soldiers have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and so you've all proven yourself in combat situations. You've proven that you're a, con a contributor to the NATO alliance. I will say, as a retired United States Army general officer, uh, I am very proud to have Lithuania as a NATO ally. Um, by the way, I should mention uh, the Pennsylvania uh, National Guard yeah. uh, is a state partner with Lithuania, and that, and that relationship goes back well over 20 years, and it's a very close relationship. So uh, again, I know a lot about Lithuania. I've been here many times. Um, and I, I understand the values that you all have, and it's just, uh, I will say to the Lithuanian people, should be very proud of the Lithuanian Armed Forces. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. All right, my pleasure. Thank my you. My pleasure. Pleasure was mine. Yep. Yeah, thank you.